I look forward to the discussion today, which I think is not an important topic and should be a very enlightening one. Uh, I must make one or two announcements before I introduce our distinguished speaker and his distinguished uh, interlocutor, and uh, that is, would you please turn off your mobile phones so that they don't interrupt the, uh, the event? Um, secondly, I have to announce um, uh, a slight change in the program. Um, my colleague, David Martin-Jones, who was to have been a commentator, is unfortunately uh, delayed in London and is not able to be here, but I'm, I will shortly introduce um, a, a, another uh, colleague who is uh, a guest of ours here at the moment, who is a more than adequate replacement. Um, now, the family uh, in Western political thought is our topic. Um, and of course, um, we all, uh, most of people, I should say, are born into families. And uh, those who are not, uh, we call orphans. And, and we generally feel sorry for them, for what they lack as a result. Um, but of course, um, the family, although it is, in my view, a natural institution, is not necessarily an automatic one. Um, and in recent years, it has become surprising to a surprising degree, um, a, a, a topic of controversy. It is indeed at the moment under attack. And yet at the same time, it is considered important by almost all the political leaders, by the churches, um, by social institutions. And to the degree that even those who I and uh, you might regard as the opponents of the family, nonetheless tend to argue not that they are against it, but that they'd like to see a wider and more humane definition of the family. So um, the conf the, the, a lot of confusion needs to be cleared away and some clear uh, social facts established. It is therefore post both politically uh, vulnerable and politically pivotal. How have political thinkers understood the relationship between politics and the household? What constructive role does the family play in the shaping of political life? Um, these are the questions which preoccupy us at the moment. Um, and instead of focusing solely on the sociological or psychological or economic evidence of the family, uh, today we're going to have a lecture on the importance of the family um, as it has been seen by important thinkers across Western history. Um, from Aristotle onwards, political thinkers have understood the relationship between the family and political society as an important one, and we hope by examining it um, to provide fresh answers to the questions of why the family matters for politics, and I think I would add why the attacks on the family matter almost as much. Uh, our commentator um, uh, on this occasion is a good, somebody who is by now a good friend. He's a visiting fellow here at the Institute, uh, Daniel Mahoney, um, and among the, the many books which he has um, written is uh, one on Cardinal Miscenti um, and another on um, uh, Roger Scruton, who has been very much a focus of our conversations in recent days. Um, but of course, um, the family in Western intellectual history is one of the topics which he is most conversant and we're therefore very glad indeed that he is on hand here. Uh, Simon Kennedy, our lecturer, uh, is an intellectual historian. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Queensland. He is a visiting fellow and we're at the Matthias Corvinus Collegium. Uh, and we're grateful to the MCC for lending him to us today. And, uh, and, um, and his research, he's also a fellow of the University of Queensland. We, rather have a, we seem to have a special relationship with the University of Queensland <laughs> because we've had several distinguished academics from there. Um, and, and, that's, um, and we're very glad about, of that. Um, uh, though I won't read uh, um, Dr. Kennedy's um, entire biography. I will mention that uh, his first book 
entitled Reforming the Law of Nature, the Secularization of Political Thought, um, uh, was published uh, last year with the Edinburgh University Press. Uh, and uh, it, it is obviously a book in which he would, I imagine, be drawing, it's one that we are drawing upon today. Um, so I think we have a strong topic. I think we have two extremely strong um, people to talk about it. I look forward myself as a member of the audience to enjoying it. Dr. Kennedy, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Uh, you were too kind, really, to say I was distinguished alongside uh, Professor Mahoney, who I've just met 15 minutes ago, and I was delighted and surprised to know that he's my interlocutor today, but I'm, I'm looking forward to the, the chat afterwards. So thanks for coming along, and thank you all to, for coming too, and for the invitation, uh, which actually came through David Martin-Jones, who can't be here today, and he regrets that. He told me so a few times, but thanks, John and Melissa, for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing with you all. Uh, the, so, as John's already said, families are important. That seems self-evident. But as John also mentioned, people on all sides of politics recognise this. Uh, Joe Biden in 2021 had a big policy set piece called the American Families Plan. And Joe uh, Biden is obviously one of the most left-wing presidents, if not the most left-wing president in America's history. And then on the other side of politics, you have someone like Georgia Maloney in Italy who... Uh, had a successful campaign slogan in the elections last year, God, Homeland and Family. Family. So politicians all over the Western world, no matter whether they're on the right or the left, rely on the idea of the family in one form or another to appeal to their electorates. In Hungary here, uh, which is, of course, a country famous for its pro-family outlook, the fundamental law of 2020, or the basic law, which was... Um, obviously formed years earlier, but it's since been updated. It's this, this is what the, the basic law of Hungary says about the family. It says, we hold that the family and the nation constitute the principal framework of our coexistence. And it goes on to say, and I quote, that Hungary shall protect the family as the basis of the survival of the nation. And so this is in the fundamental law, which is essentially the constitution of Hungary. And then an act from 2011, which is subtitled the Protection of Families Act, says this, the family is an autonomous community established in human history before the emergence of law and the state. And it rests on moral grounds. Now, that's a very complicated sentence, which I'm not going to unpack, but there's a lot in there. Uh, it also says that the family is Hungary's most important natural resource, as the basic unit of society, the family is the guarantee of the nation's survival. Growing up in a family is safer than any other possibility. This is all from the Protection of Families Act of 2011. Now, it's not just Hungary that thinks the family is important and recognises this in its law. At international law, the family is also significant. If you read Article 23 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, it says this. The family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state. And the European Social Charter of 1961 carries a similar sentiment. It said, the family as a fundamental unit of society has a right, has the right, I should say, to appropriate social, legal and economic protection to ensure its full development. Now, despite this bipartisan supranational support of the family. Some portray the family as dangerous and regressive. And, of course, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were on the avant-garde of this. Um, they were infamous for their claim that the bourgeois family, the middle-class family, was a crutch of capitalist oppression. But radical socialists are not the only propagators of this line of thinking. The feminist argument against the family was quite common back in the 1970s, but it's recently been revived by Kathy Weeks of Duke University, who has one of these very colourful titles of uh, Professor of Gender Studies and Sexuality and so on and so on. Uh, but Professor Weeks um, argued in a recent article in Feminist Study, a Feminist Theory, which is a, a, a high-ranking feminist journal, 
uh, argued that societies that maintain traditional and natural family units need to work towards a, and I quote, radical structural transformation, with a key part of this being made possible by the transformation of society that makes families less necessary. And she suggests that activists work for a, and I quote, lessening of the coercive forces that drive people into families and block their exits from families. <laughs> Thank you for the chuckle, I agree. Uh, <laughs> um, challenges to the family come from beyond the ivory tower though as well. Uh, courts and jurists have been busy reframing the family as a legal entity for some time. And this, these changes and reframings recognize, are, are reflective of a general, more general shift in how our societies understand the family. Um, the natural family is no longer assumed, but rather it's the, more, the modern conventional family that is the norm. And the uh, jurist Gregor Pupink puts it like so. He says this in his book um, on European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. He says that the European Court of Human Rights has progressively removed its objective consistency and now recognises the family where there exists close personal links, and I'm putting scare quotes because he's quoting from actual cases here, close personal links or genuine personal ties between adults and children in the absence of biological or juridical links. In other words, the European Court is now recognising that families can exist whether people are related to each other by blood and biology or whether someone has been adopted legally into a family or married together. Simply, there have to be two adults, whatever their sex, in the absence of marriage and potentially children as well. So in sum, the family is simultaneously considered important by people on all sides of politics, and yet there has been a significant change in the way that we think about the family, and that's reflected in juridical norms. So if the family is in fact pivotal for society, as the IP, CCPR says, and as the Hungarian law says, and various other uh, legal statements say, then it should benefit from deep philosophical reflection on why that's the case. So these are some of the questions I'm going to explore today. What is the meaning and importance of the family in politics? How have political thinkers framed the role of the family in political life? And what are the implications of this line of political thought for our own understanding of the family in politics today? And as all good histories of Western thought do, um, st they all start in Greece, ancient Greece, and so I'm going to go back to there now with you to Aristotle. And Aristotle uttered the following paradigmatic words in sometime in the 4th century BC. He said, man is a zoon politikun, a political animal. And so it sounds like he's saying, well, all we need is politics. But for Aristotle, the family is very important. He says the family is the oikos, that's the Greek word for what was translated now as household. And it's where we get our word economics from. Oikonomika comes from oikos, and we get economics from that word. The oikos contains mother and father and children, but it also contains grandparents and other extended family, household workers, slaves, and even animals. These households, Aristotle says, form villages and then they form cities in order to reach a state of what he calls self-sufficiency. So in this sense, the polis or the city needs the family or the oikos to form into the highest community. It needs families in order to build itself into a city, which is for Aristotle the highest form of human community. But the family isn't simply pivotal so that everyone can band together and form a city. Households also exist to form citizens, people who display civic virtue. Uh, Aristotle says that these citizens are prepared for a life of public service in the oikos. So while the household exists, he says, to serve everyday needs, it also exists to serve the city. He argues that it makes a difference that a city's children be excellent and its women too, and he singles them out because most of the time he's assuming that he's talking about Men, of course, because they were the people who participated in the life of the city in the public sense. But he's actually saying no, the women and the children need to be excellent as well because the women are half of the free population, and I'm quoting here, and from children come those who share in the constitution. 
So the household is, according to Aristotle, a part of the city and it looks to the good of the whole. The household is a part and it looks to the good of the whole, which is the city. And therefore, the household is the training ground for life in the city, for life in the political community. Aristotle says that the excellence of the political community depends upon the excellence and virtue of those who emerge from families to participate in political life. The writings of Augustine of Hippo, which is, who was a 4th century Catholic bishop, show that this way of thinking about the family actually continued into Christian antiquity and didn't just stay in Greece. Augustine says that politics exists for the sake of order and peace. He's quite um, consistent about that. That's the main reason that politics exists. But just as peace, he says, between mortal man and his maker consists in ordered obedience, so he says that peace in social life between people consists in regulated fellowship. And he says that this expresses itself in the family in the, and I quote, ordered harmony of authority and obedience between the members of the family living together. And then it expresses itself in the same way in the political community as an ordered harmony of authority and obedience between citizens. So there's an analogy between the relationships that we see in the family and in the city, according to Augustine. Now, Augustine's view as a Christian theologian is that the aim of the earthly citizen is to reach heaven, the peace of the city of God. But he also then says, but our social life, our regulated fellowship in social life is an important part of the journey toward that peace in the city of God. After all, one of the great commandments is to love your neighbour as yourself. And Augustine goes on to observe that the primary place people are called to do this is, in fact, in the family. The head of the family, he says, and I quote, must help his wife and children and servants and all others whom he can influence. And in showing this care, he will arrive at peace as much as in him lies with every man. So just like Aristotle, Augustine sees a direct connection between peace in the family and peace in the city. Every home, he argues, should be a beginning or a fragmentary constituent of a civil community and every beginning related to some specific end and every part to the whole of which it is a part. And it ought to follow from this, he says, that domestic peace, peace in the home, has a relation to political peace. And so once again, we see in Augustine the idea that the civic realm is impacted by the formation of and lives of those who dwell in families. But where does um, our obligation towards political authority come from? Is that connected somehow to the family? Well, thinkers in the Middle Ages and in the Reformation argued that this was the case. Starting in the latter Middle Ages, Christian theologians began to interpret the command, and depending on which tradition you're from, if you're a Catholic, it's the fourth commandment. If you're a Protestant, it's the fifth commandment, the command to honour your father and mother. Thinkers started to apply this not just to domestic relations but also to the civic realm. And Thomas Aquinas is a good example of this, as he is of many things. In his commentary on the fourth commandment, he says that the word father refers not just to domestic fathers but also to rulers and kings because their whole care is the good of their people. And Bonaventure is of a similar mind. He says that anyone who presides over public affairs, such as a prince, or a baron or a count is called a father. And in summary, the Protestant reformers argued the same thing, Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Tyndale, and so on. But it was the most famous opponent of the French Revolution, Edmund Burke, who expanded the importance of the family for political thinking beyond the question of obligation and piety towards your parents. Burke, in his reflections on the revolution in France, links the family with national and civic identity. And in this, he sets in train a tradition of thinking about families and politics that stretches through what we call the conservative tradition. In the first place, Burke discusses the political traditions and rights of Britain and ca calls it a kind of family inheritance. He argues that the rights and privileges of the British people, which he folds under the unwritten constitution, as, and I quote, an entailed inheritance in, from our forefathers. 
But this analogy between the transmission of family inheritance and that of political and constitutional norms is not the limit of Burke's deployment of the family. The British have, in Burke's view, and I quote, given to our frame of polity the image of a relation in blood, binding up the constitution of our country with our dearest domestic ties. The nation is not like a family. It is a family in some sense. Burke says we have adopted our fundamental laws into the bosom of our family affections. Love of nation, of our fellows, is not only similar in kind, but these familial affections are, in fact, in some sense, the same, according to Burke. But he does not conflate the affection of national fellowship with familial fellowship in a way that squashes the differences between them. Nevertheless, he does suggest that the warmth with which one feels about one's country is founded upon the bosom of our family affections. Now, where can this affection be cultivated? Burke's answer to this question is one of his most famous utterances. He says, to be attached to the subdivision, to love the little platoon we belong to in society is the first principle, the germ, as it were, of public affections. And if you look closely at the context for this quote, I would argue that the little platoon is unquestionably the family, which Burke goes on to describe as the first link in a series by which we proceed toward a love of country and to mankind. And for Burke, the family is the location of real rights as opposed to the abstract and what he called metaphysical conceptions of rights that the French revolutionaries were arguing for. And some of the rights he lists are these. He says, men have a right to the acquisitions of their parents, to the nourishment and improvement of their offspring, to instruction in life and to consolation in death. Burke shows that the family constitutes a place of growth, vitality and consolation. It is a ground for the civic, growth of civic virtues and affections. The family is where people can attain their true natural rights as opposed to the abstract metaphysical rights that Burke's opponents argue for. Now, on the question of metaphysical abstractions, there could hardly be a greater distance than the one between Burke and the German idealist philosopher J.W.F. Hegel. And yet in Hegel, we find a fascinating articulation of the importance of the family, one that's not actually at odds with Burke. The family is, for Hegel, um, the natural ethical community. Actually, before I go on, I should say that Hegel is uh, notoriously unwieldy uh, and difficult to understand and his, uh, his language is difficult to uh, translate and so I'm going to do my very best to make him understandable but <laughs> so please bear with me yeah yeah I've got to, yeah that's right that's right um, I'm going to do my best <laughs> so he calls the family the natural ethical community which is the initial place where the person who is reaching for the absolute ideal of freedom he says that's the goal of the person but also the goal of history uh, this is the place, the family is the place where the person who is reaching for that ideal of freedom steps into the world. And this ethical life for Hegel is one where abstract rights and duties become concrete. So there are abstract rights and duties according to Hegel, but they become instantiated, they become concrete in the family. And this is the first place where these are made concrete. And the family, interestingly for Hegel, has the individual as one of its ends, but the state, which is what he calls reason, he calls it reason personified, is the highest end of the individual. And so in this sense, and I believe in a very dangerous sense, the family and the individual are pointed toward the state. And according to Hegel, they find their fulfillment in the state. The individual is, for Hegel, only, and I quote, actual and substantial when she becomes a citizen of the state. If the individual's conscious identity ceases with the family, Hegel says that she is, and I quote, only an impotent, unreal shadow. Now, we can set that objection aside. I disagree with that, that idea. But we can see that in some ways he goes on to argue along the same lines as Aristotle. The family is the foundation of the ethical life and therefore, in some sense, it's the foundation of civic life. Hegel says the dissolution of the family through children going and marrying other people, starting new families, feeds into the political life of the community. He says that the family disintegrates, and this is not a negative thing, it's a positive thing for Hegel, it creates new families, becomes a plurality of families, and then he says people are released to transform the original family into new 
families. And furthermore, it's at this point that families join with other families and create civil society. And civil society is, in Hegel's words, a universal family where individuals who are or were members of families come together and meet one, each other's, one another's needs for subsistence, protection and justice. But even civil society is subordinated to a higher form of the idea, which this is the word that he uses. And the higher form of the highest form of the idea is the state. The family is therefore subordinated to this end. It exists to begin the individual's journey to the highest end, which is the subsuming of oneself into the life of the state. Um, Hegel's philosophy of the family is paradoxical because he offers a profound and powerful philosophical account of the family and at the same time he grinds the family into seeming significance in his account of politics. But the English philosopher Roger Scruton, who is my last thinker for today, retains aspects of Hegel's account of the family, but he moderates him in important ways. In the first place, Scruton insists that the family is autonomous. It has no other aim beside itself. The family exists because of nature. It provides its participants with an unending source of rational objectives, which are directed towards the love and care of those that you are joined with. Scruton argues that the family aims beyond the immediate good of its members and towards a continuation of itself into the future, which is a future that is actually out of sight for those who are currently alive. Our families will continue into the future, ideally, and we won't see that happen. This is in some sense the aim of the family. And so it's quite different to civil society institutions. The family constitutes something like a transcendent bond, a unity that extends beyond immediate commercial exchanges of goods in daily life, in the home and in the civil community. The family for Scruton is sacred because it comes endowed with a goal that transcends the members who are a part of it at that time. But what about politics then? How does the family relate to politics according to Scruton? There are two primary ways. One is via the affections that the family cultivates and the other is the relationship between the family and political obligations. Like Burke, Scruton sees the family as the foundation for political affections and therefore for political allegiance. In families, people begin to recognise what Scruton calls the exercise of established power and the exercise of freedom. Being constrained to the will and authority of a parental figure, which we all remember is a very difficult thing to be constrained to, um, being constrained to that will and authority uh, without having given consent gives the child an understanding they could not otherwise have. They learn that they're a part of something greater than themselves, part of a larger story, a reality that is founded upon something beyond their own will. In Scruton's words, this realisation prepares for the inevitable recognition of constraint, helplessness and subjection to external will that heralds the individual's realisation that he is a part of society. And from this recognition of this unchosen and weighty membership of society flows the political affections. In Scruton's words, in this recognition, love of one's country is born. But perhaps the most profound aspect of Scruton's thought regarding politics and the family is the stress he places on the idea of piety. In Scruton's words, piety is a posture of submission and obedience towards authorities that you have never chosen. Piety is, in this sense, acting on obligations toward any authority that is given to us rather than chosen by us. All people are under weighty obligations to things they did not choose. This is inescapable and creates in every person what Scruton calls a sense of frailty and dependence, resulting in the acknowledgement that the burden we inherit cannot be sustained unaided. And it also cultivates in us a thankful disposition. Piety underlies our family relationships, particularly those with our parents and grandparents. We have obligations to our parents and grandparents that we did not choose and we cannot rescind them without some kind of moral transgression. And it is these relationships of piety that provide a basis for obligation in the political sphere. As Scruton puts it, piety instills a readiness to be guided and instructed. Modern political thought, especially liberal political thought, has sought to remove piety from political theory. 
But as Scruton and more recently the Israeli philosopher Yoram Hazoni has argued, this picture of the isolated individual entering a fictional social contract, which is the most common account of the origins of politics in liberal thought, has no basis for the realities of political life. Hegel is right to point out that our unchosen allegiance to our families provides a sound basis for, to paraphrase Scruton, launching ourselves into the sphere of choice where we seem to determine our bonds to others independently of our family. But both Scruton and Hegel show us that this independence and sense of personal choice when we leave our families is in some sense a chimera when it comes to the political sphere. We enter into the sphere of choice and when we do, we find ourselves in a political community where we're joined together by bonds of piety, not bonds of the social contract. This piety expands out from the family and becomes directed toward a state that, in Scruton's words, offers security and permanence of law. In this sense, the state stands upon a foundation of piety, a piety that is first forged in the family. So this brief exploration of the history of political thought has revealed three things, uh, in summary, about the connection between the family and politics. First, the family is crucial for politics because it is the ground on which citizens are formed. And someone like Johannes Althusius, who was an early modern Protestant jurist, wrote of the family in the 17th century and used the image of the seedbed to describe its relationship to political life. Domestic peace is directly related to civic peace, as Augustine says. And this means that wherever the family goes, so goes the political community. Now, we all know that families are never perfect. Mine certainly isn't. And broken families, of course, can still be places where virtue is cultivated. So we're not talking necessarily here about the ideal family. But if families are not seedbeds of virtue, political life will suffer and decline. Second, we can see that families are the foundation for coherent political communities. Indeed, they are, in a sense, the foundation for nations. Nations are usually tied together by a set of common origins based on history, geography, traditions, and to an extent, blood ties. A person's ties to their nation are usually familial, and they're primarily shaped by the home they grew up in. I am Australian and I identify myself with Australia because my parents are Australian. Now that tie could be a legal one, it could be via adoption into a family, or it could be via natural blood relations, as is my case. But in either case, the family, the little platoon, to use Burke's words, is the reason why people identify with their nation, generally speaking. Thirdly and finally, the family is the basis for political obligation, or at least a basis. Contrary to liberal political philosophy, it is the relations of the family that provide ground, the grounds for political allegiance. The abstract individual does not exist, except in the imagination of the liberal political philosopher. But what does exist? The family exists. It is this natural bond between people and families that works itself out into piety. Why should we obey laws and respect rulers and pledge allegiance to our nation? As Scruton says, it is the ought of piety which recognises the unquestionable rightness of local, transitory and historically conditioned social bonds. This attitude of piety cultivated first in the home is extended out into relations of authority, obligation and duty in the political sphere. Filial piety is the basis of political piety, which is in turn the real basis upon which the state stands. Thank you for your attention. Simon, thank you very much indeed. That was a marvellous talk. It now gives me a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Daniel Mahoney. Well, that was a marvellous talk, and I can't say I disagree with anything substantive in the talk, but I still have a fair amount of things to say. Um, let me begin by saying that um, I think the broad outline of the talk is exactly on mark, that the individual uh, posited by liberal political philosophy doesn't exist. Uh, Bertrand de Juvenel, uh, a French political philosopher of the 20th century, 
wrote a book in the early 1960s called The Pure Theory of Politics. And the middle section of the book is entitled Ego in Otherdom. And he points out that, as he says, the, the, the account of the early modern political philosophers, or at least the grandfathers or, or fathers of modern liberalism, um, is just palpably empirically untrue. Uh, he calls the theorists of social contract, Hobbes and Locke in particular, uh, uh, fatherless men who have forgotten their own childhood. You know, in other words, um, they give an account of the origins of social life as based wholly and exclusively on voluntary consent. And that describes no human arrangement ever, and not even human arrangements today in societies that exaggerate the role of explicit consent and forget, as Burke and Scruton point out, that the vast majority of our obligations in life are unchosen. That's a theme I will return to a little bit later. So in a way, uh, by the way, the liberal order has done a lot of good, um, and it's uh, perhaps reminded us of the crucial role of consent, not only in political life, political arrangements, but also in social life. But it has exaggerated that role to the point that uh, it's put forward an anthropology that is incoherent and can't be sustained. And I'll put it this way, for a long time, the liberal order thrived because it didn't try to live up to its own theory too consistently. In other words, it depended on the common sense of a larger Western moral and civic inheritance. And that common sense is fraying. And it's not only fraying, but it's coming under, as you point out. Your, your beginning of your talk was, um, um, I think, uh, we, we academics do this. We're all sides. We have a bipartisan consensus. I mean, we don't. Um, as you point out in paragraphs two and three, the the natural family has been under systematic assault theoretically and increasingly practically for a long time. Think back, uh, Jimmy Carter, you, you non-Anglophone uh, people might, uh, uh, you know, very odd to have an American president, James Earl Carter was Jimmy. Rugged informality, you know. He's still, he's still going at 102 or so, but he held a big conference at the White House. And it wasn't a conference on the family. It was a conference on families. And that was in the 70s. But it was already pointing to the idea that the normative natural family is a thing of the past, and that families are almost exclusively the products of voluntary consent. Now, I'm going to shock you all by quoting Immanuel Kant. You won't recognize this remark, but he said it. And it's not his final word on marriage. But he said, from a strictly contractual point of view, and he shared that view to some extent, although he wanted to elevate it and moralize it because he is the modern philosopher of duty, of the categorical imperative. But he defined marriage as a mutual contract a contract for the mutual manipulation of genitalia. Well, I would suggest that as um, unnerving as that remark is, it's more or less the contemporary understanding in theory and practice of what marriage is, and therefore what lies at the basis of family. Uh, it's reductive. Uh, Roger Scruton, for example, who uh, played a, a significant role in this presentation, wrote a beautiful book, a difficult book, a kind of phenomenology of sexual desire, called 500-page book called Sexual Desire, uh, published in 1986, where he points out that uh, sex is either between persons who are morally and mutually accountable, or it is simply a form of desecration and moral pollution. So in other words, um, if sexual desire is going to be vindicated as a natural human activity with intrinsic dignity, 
it's precisely because it's not the same as the Pornographic Act. It's not simply an agreement for the mutual manipulation of genitalia. I promise not to say that again. Uh, <laughs> I say that once a semester to shock the students, you know. They, 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 they suddenly become moralists, you know. Uh, when they hear those words, but uh, so anyway, that's a look. I have, uh, John Roberts, who's the Chief Justice of the American Supreme Court, and his dissent in the Obergefell decision, which in effect you judicially imposed so-called same-sex marriage on the American people. He raised the question: What's so magical about the number two? And the an answer is. Based on these premises, nothing. So where I live in progressive Ma Massachusetts, um, the cities of Arlington and Somerville, which are suburbs of Boston, have now passed legislation giving full rights of coupling pensions benefits to so-called throuples. So we've increased the number from two to three, but in principle, why not five or six or seven? You know, in other words, there's no natural basis for throupling other than pure consent. And Roger Scruton would suggest um, a not so human and humane understanding of sexual desire and obligation. So, um, uh, by the way, the words in the Hungarian constitution and the uh, the later Family Acts, 2011, et cetera, they sound very traditional, but they were the commonplace understanding of the family in the Western tradition until not very long ago. Uh, Louis de Bonald, who is a, uh, we often associated with uh, Joseph de Mestre as one of the French reactionaries or retrogrades, there's a, he wrote a little pamphlet in 1821 called On Divorce. And the French, remember this is during the Restoration, after the Bourbon were back in power in 1815. And there was, a, <laughs> there was a piece of legislation in the assembly um, that would have legalized divorce just a little bit for the rarest cases where there's systematic abuse or uh, a husband isn't taking care of his wife, et cetera. And Bolnold predicted once you introduce the principle, soon that, prin that principled exception will define the nature of, institu of the institution. So, Bolo was a crank, but he was right. You know, it's very hard to find a middle way between the understanding of the family as a natural institution linked to unchosen obligations and the view that it's merely consensual. Let me say a quick word about John Locke, because you, everything you said about the limits of the liberal point of view, especially when it comes to the family, I think is absolutely unmarked, but people often forget that John Locke was the author not only of the second treatise on civil government, which laid much of the philosophical and institutional framework of the liberal order, but he's the author of the first treatise, which is a critique of filmer and patriarchalism. So Locke wanted to assassinate, you know, to murder that classical medieval view that the family, that, that, that the king or the ruler or the statesman is in some sense a father. But in doing so, he very much weakened the whole idea of unchosen obligations. And I'll give you an example. He says that we owe our parents in their old age as much as we think they gave us. So if you think mama and papa were you know, not always perfect and good, well, maybe you, you stick them in a less expensive nursing home. Or perhaps you don't help them at all. It's a very, very frontal assault on the notion of fundamental, natural, familial piety. Um, one quick remark about Aristotle. I think everything you said about Aristotle was extremely astute and accurate. I would just add that uh, contrary to legend, you know, Aristotle goes out of his way to say that the family is a, um, a political institution in the sense of 
uh, the rule of the man over the woman, if there is such a rule, is royal and political. Politics, in Aristotle's understanding, means ruling and being ruled in turn. In other words, it's reciprocal. It is not despotism. Despotes, in Greek, is the rule over masters over slaves. So to say that family and the relationship between men and women is a form of royal and political rule is to say that strict patriarchalism is not in accord with nature. And by the way, the rule of, over children is royal, it means you prepare them for self-government. So uh, people often miss that aspect of Aristotle. Um, let me move along. Uh, let me turn to Burke very quickly. I think you're absolutely right in your discussion of Burke and Scruton to speak about the central role of unchosen obligations in family life, but in human life more broadly. And while Burke was certainly a liberal in the sense of believing in representative government and free commerce and uh, religious liberty to, to a large extent, he really challenged liberalism if liberalism meant that the only legitimate bonds and ties are voluntarily chosen. He thought that was madness. He thought it was unsustainable. I think he thought it was empirically and morally false. And I think Scruton follows uh, Burke in that regard. I mean, think of the, the, the famous section, the, one of maybe the most memorable sections, along with the Little Platoons quote, the one everyone quotes from the Reflections, where uh, Burke talks about the political community not just being a partnership, uh, a partnership in trade, in trading calico and coffee, but he calls it a, a, a primordial contract connecting the living, the dead, and the yet to be born. You know, it's not a uh, Jefferson said the political community is a contract to the living, and he even recommended in a letter from 1813 that each generation you know, choose its own constitution. Well, Madison very wisely said that won't do. You, know, you need reverence for existing institutions. So in that sense, Madison was much more traditional than Jefferson. Uh, so in the long and short of it, I would say um, that uh, what, the, what the Christian tradition adds, but also can be found in a more secular form in Burke and Hegel and Scruton, is this understanding of piety, of the sacred as an essential element of both family and political life. We have to be very careful. Um, when Hegel talks about the state, he doesn't, he's not speaking about the state the way Gentili or Mussolini spoke about this. It's, it's self-limiting, it's uh, heterogeneous, it has different levels, um, but we, we can still quarrel with, uh, I think the Aristotelian idea of the political is richer yeah. and less state-centered, you yeah. know, well, the yeah. Aristotle had no idea of the state. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, I think the reminder that the sacred, the pious, the unchosen, is a central and enduring part of human and political life, is an indispensable truth. Uh, we live in a society that not only ignores that truth, but aims to bury it, but we can't. We can only mutilate human and political life by ignoring fundamental truths about the very constitution of the human being. And I think it's like where we're at now. We're warring against the indestructible foundations of the social bond. And the question will be whether we can step back from the precipice, not rejecting the great achievements of liberal politics, but refusing to turn that into a metaphysics that will bulldoze, you might say, the, the moral foundations of civil society. I'll leave it at that.
now we, we have about half an hour. Thank you. We've now had two very powerful presentations. And we have about half an hour, uh, which I'm going to start myself by asking a couple of questions. Uh, and then I'm going to throw it open to you. And the first question is uh, this: the relationship at the moment between the state and the child. And I mention it because in some ways we might, I think, a lot of people would say today, particularly in the age of divorce, that the relationship between a mother and son, a father and daughter, is even stronger than between husband and wife. Certainly uh, harder to break. And yet, um, and for that reason, until very recently, 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the rights of the parent to control the child's education, for example, and general upbringing, was enshrined in international law quite unmistakably. And yet in recent um, years, we have seen one wing of politics. I don't think that's an exaggeration. I would say at the moment, the Democratic Party has put itself on record several times in America and other parties in Europe. And the, I would say the European Commission in general and so on have put themselves on the side of a very reduced role for parents in controlling their children's education to the point of actually denying the validity of that, um, of, 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 of that item in the, in the list of human rights. So my question is, can you both give me some idea of how this has happened and whether it's reversible? Yeah, so I mean, the, one of the examples that I'm thinking of as you say this is Scotland, where there, parent, there's parent A and parent B and the state is looking to take on really the role of parent. And that's the kind of thing you're thinking of, if, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, how did this happen? I mean, I, th I think that it is in part at least a working out of the more insidi insidious aspects of liberal, not insidious, I shouldn't say it's an insidious aspect of liberalism. I think it's an unhinged aspect of liberalism, which emphasizes the individual. And uh, the dangerous uh, aspect of liberalism I'm thinking of is that the individual is understood as sort of standing naked before the all powerful state, and there's no intermediating institutions or authorities between the individual and the state. And this strikes me as a consistent outworking of that. Um, and the role of parents is very troublesome for the state because they can they can say things that the state might disagree with, or that the laws might the laws of the state might be contradicted by what the parents say. And this is very very difficult for a, for the liberal state now for some for some reason. I mean, previously individual freedom was important. I'm not sure what happened along the way, but. Uh, this strikes me as a, a part of that liberal anthropology. That there's the individual and the state, and this is the basic underpinnings that lead to that, I think. Daniel, do you, do you have Yeah, thoughts? no, no, I agree with that completely. And I, I would say that, um, you know, for a long time, the liberal, the, the, you might say the sort of compromise between the liberal affirmation of political consent, but the recognition of moral authority in civil society, the university, the army, the family, the churches, the, the compromise helped for a long time because um, the, the kind of liberalism that was dominant in the Western world tended to be a conservative-minded liberalism that did not push modernity without restraint, did not push that thoroughgoing anthropology of radical consent and individualism. I think one reason it's practical and theoretical why uh, progressives in the West want to diminish parental power is they recognize, not that they're particularly theoretically minded, but they, they recognize that the individual is not natural, that he has to be created, you know? And so leftism has become a transgressive project. It, uh, it aims to actively undermine that which is an obstacle to the thoroughgoing victory of, um, I would say, the ethos of autonomy, you know, that is, Tocqueville has a wonderful expression in the old regime and the revolution. He talks about liberty under God and the law. That was, that was a, a conservative liberal vision that political liberty and personal rights always exist within a broader moral and anthropological, maybe even cosmic framework that inform, you know, we have freedom. What are we going to do with our freedom, you know? 
If there's no ends and purposes guiding it, we have vertigo. We go crazy, you know? And, uh, but now I think the, the project, is, it's activist, it's coercive, it's transgressive. Um, and you see this in the United States with uh, the transgender project, you know, often teachers and therapists and doctors are presiding over the transition, mainly of these young prepubescent girls, and they're not telling the parents, because if they tell the parents, there might be the reassertion of uh, good sense, you know? Of course, I don't want to paint a uniform picture of the United States. This tends to be in the more progressive areas, but, um, you know, Boston General Hospital uh, in Boston just you know, has a whole unit that specializes in transitioning prepubescent children, and it's often done without the consent of parents. So, And I will say this, though, so I, I, I don't want to appear unduly pessimistic. There's a very strong tradition in the United States supporting private education, parochial education, and this is reasserting itself with homeschooling, and especially, and now with these classical schools, uh, some Protestant, some Catholic, some secular, great book schools. And it's in that milieu, I think, that uh, the, the sustenance of this more traditional moral ethos undergirding liberal society persists. So it's an open, it's a contest. But I would say the, the, the party of moral transgression is definitely the party of state power at the service of a project of radical autonomy that has to be imposed. And um, I think that's been going on for a long time, but it has accelerated so quickly and so dramatically that it appears like things have radically changed in the last few years. They haven't really radically changed. The, you know, Solzhenitsyn had the image of, uh, of uh, Marxism in, the, in, in Russia, the red wheel. For a long time, it, it churned. And then from 1914 to 1918, you know, yeah. the wheel turned. And I think the wheel's turning right now. But it's been turning for a while. But it's now moving with a sort of locomotive power that is quite remarkable to see. I, I, I would like now to, in a sense, ask the same question about it the institution of marriage and certainly the idea of marriage being um, indissoluble or in, let's just say much more stable than it now is. Um, I'm very struck, I mean, we're dueling with quotations here, but I'm very struck when I was reading um, uh, John Stuart Mill's On Liberty some years ago, this is not an exact quote, but we know Mill, uh, among other things, as the rights, as a champion of the rights of women. And there may not be inconsistency here, but um, I came across a passage in which he says, quite frankly, he says, look, uh, you cannot have people persuading, you cannot have someone persuading another person to invest all their emotional happiness and permanence in, in a marriage with them and then simply allow them to walk off. Yep, that is what the law now does. And indeed, I think if anybody who tries to say, well, I don't want this marriage to break up, I won't grant a divorce, we don't allow them to do that, and we even regard them as acting maliciously. So what I, and now there is some evidence, and it'd be interesting to what you, how important that evidence is, that the children of marriages like this in recent years have come to want something quite different and more traditional. Um, and there certainly are quite strong traditional um, Catholic and Christian movements of young people in Western Europe, particularly in France and, and I think Spain too. But um, my question would be, it's very well to want those things, but are, they, are those things attainable without changes in the law? And is there any prospect of that happening? So this time I'll start with Daniel. Well, I do. I do think in the end. Oh, I, I do think in the end there has to be change in law, but not at the beginning. There has to be a change in attitudes, and that means cultural transformation, which will be slow and very difficult, especially with the decline of religion, the weakening of the family, etc. But 
You know, if there really is an enduring human nature, something in the human soul is going to cry out about the poverty and paucity of these social arrangements. And I think John's right that that's happened. Uh, the, the consensus, when I was a young man uh, and a child, uh, the consensus was, uh, you know, very much in favor, was moving in favor of no-fault divorce in the States, and the view was, you know, the parents bicker, they have problems, it's better for the kids if they break up. No one really believes that anymore. You know, uh, uh, people really know that there's a psychic, spiritual, civic, psychological cost to the, you know, widespread divorce, and, uh, and of course, so many Americans... Well, Daniel Patrick Moynihan famously pointed out that uh, in 1964, the dramatic drop in uh, two-parent households in the black community, when there was more segregation and discrimination, the black family was intact. And by the 1964, when Moynihan wrote the Morning Band Report, 40% of black children were born out of wedlock. Well, now it's 80%. And 43 or 45% of white Americans are born out of wedlock. So... Um, but um, one thing that concerns me is um, from the 1970s through 2005 or so, the official response of the Catholic Church was pretty solid on all of this. It was countercultural. It refused to accept the sexual revolution as the defining, providing the, the, the defining criteria of how human beings ought to live. I do think there's much confusion in Rome today. The Germans, a large part of the pure Curia, the, the Pope on Monday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday, you know, they're, they're really in, there's a push toward accommodate, um, well, you know, the, the, the modern autonomous ethos, and I think that'll be the death of Christianity. Uh, um, Rod Dreyer, you know, who's an associate, who works with the Danube Institute, makes this point rather more dramatically than I do, and some people have accused him of being hung up on the sexual revolution, these things. But I think he, if the church capitulates on that, as the mainstream of the Church of England has, then it ceases to offer an alternative to this corrupt modern anthropology that um, Simon spoke about so well. And what does it leave us at? Why, why would anyone convert to such a religion? Why would it... Uh, why would it require any deep loyalties, et cetera? So I think the churches have to get their act together. I think they have their act together in East Central Europe. Um, they have their, their problems. But in the West, there's a very large segment of the, of the, certainly the liberal Protestant world and increasingly the progressive Catholic world that thinks all will be well if the churches capitulate to this ethos. And I think that's, I think we both think that's exact the exact opposite of the truth. Yeah, and I would, uh, to, just to briefly add to that, I think in uh, to, to echo something Daniel said right at the start, which is that there is something um, in the human soul that will eventually cry out for uh, the, 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 a stable institution of the family and so on. But not, it's not only the, indi the in human individual that's looking for that, but I think our society and our civilization needs it. If, if the thinkers that I've talked about today are right... Uh, then we it, 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 these these returns to tradition need need to be successful. Otherwise, everything will crumble. And that's not being too alarmist. I don't mean it'll happen quickly. I just mean it's a slow decline. I think it is possible for people to recapture what they're missing without the law changing. And I think that Daniel's absolutely right that culture changes before law typically and that it's, at least in this case, culture has to change before law changes. I think people can have the thing they're looking for. Young people can have the thing they're looking for. People, this is this is reflected in other ways too. People are looking for more traditional forms of Christianity, for example, and uh, you see um, people who were Pentecostals, go, you know, going to Eastern Orthodoxy, for example, because they think, well, this is it. This is where traditional Christianity is. Whether you know, there are different ways of approaching that problem, of course. But I think that this is a general trend. It's not just about family life. And so I think people can find what they're looking for. They just have to do it against the grain um, until our society changes more broadly at a cultural level. 
Well, I have one more question to put to you both before we throw it open. Um, you drew, Simon, in your talk on um, a considerable cultural range, obviously ancient Greece, um, 19th century Germany, um, 18th century Britain. And um, I wonder when we talk about the family, if we're really talking about the same thing in those three cases. I'm thinking now of the um, uh, researchers of uh, Emmanuel Todd, the French um, a sociologist who argues that there are, I think, five different kinds of families in different societies. I will mention just two. There is the Central European and German family structure, which is very patriarchal, and the uh, children really don't escape from the control of the father, paterfamilias, uh, well, really, uh, maybe until death, but certainly um, for a long time. But compared to the much looser, it appears, um, family relationship in the Anglophone world, in which the children, in which a newly married couple immediately depart the patriarchal household, set up a, a new household somewhere else, quite far away, very often, um, and generally have uh, more uh, rights and so on. Where, although it's one one difference, of course, uh, one element of that is the the family, the English family, is often thought to be somewhat cold blooded because the father has the right to disinherit everybody and leave his money to a dog's home, which the French find very shocking. Um, and I wonder, therefore, is there, is there, any, is there any sign um, when you look today at these different families, if there is some, if some are proving more substantial, staying the course more than others? I, I think an interesting example might be China. I don't, I don't know whether Todd deals with China, but the Confucian family is still quite strong, even in the face of communism uh, and even in the face of the Cultural Revolution and so on. I mean, that culture seems pretty unshakable. The children are still extremely deferential to their, their parents in the, in the way that they would have been a long, for a long time. It, so I, I, I think that there is, there is a possibility there that uh, the despite the weakness of the family in the West, uh, there are probably other f traditions and family structures that you see, for example, in Confu the Confucian civilization that, that could withstand some of this. Uh, I don't know, I guess I don't know enough about the differences between, say, the Teutonic and uh, Central, Central European and Anglophone mindsets about this. I think that it sounds like a legitimate um, observation of Todd, and I was reading Friedrich Julius Stahl, who's a 19th century German jurist, and his explanation of the family reflects exactly what you said, which is that they never quite escape the father, mm. uh, the children. So I, I think that's a really interesting point. Um, I feel I've reached my limit on what I could say about that. But you might know more, Daniel, about, about these differences. Well, I think Todd's framework is broadly true on a sociological level, but it misses some things. I mean, in the, in the Christian West, there was always a recognition, even in, in, in countries with more experience, emphatically patriarchal arrangements, that there was an element of consent that was crucial to marriage. And that's quite unique. Yeah. You know, the idea that a legitimate sacramental marriage demands consent, mm -hmm. not simply arranged marriages and this kind of thing, does suggest the limits of patriarchalism, yeah. even if feminists or contemporary sociologists call those old arrangements, patriarchal. Certainly the idea that the will of the father or husband was supreme. The Christian understanding is always that the legitimate authority, this was perhaps honored in the breach in some cases, but uh, is you know has to be subordinated to the Ten Commandments and to respect for human dignity and that kind of thing. And... Um, um, so, you know, and, and uh, look, a monogamy is a wonderfully, uh, Dennis Prager in the United States, a, a Jewish writer on public affairs, but also on family issues, has pointed out that, you know, biblical monogamy was a great source of liberation for women because it, um, you know, it, 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 vivified, it gave life to, you know, that Aristotelian account of marriage as a, as, as being reciprocal in character. And a, a man who has four or five wives is hardly going to have a reciprocal relationship with his wives. I mean, I suppose it happens, but it, <laughs> it seems to be at odds with the wellsprings of human nature. So 
I would say that, um, yes, compared to a family based exclusively on the principle of romantic attachment and voluntary choice, all the old arrangements, including the ones in the West, look patriarchal. But if you dig a little deeper, there's limits to patri patriarchy in the Western arrangements. And we sometimes forget that. The feminists really forget that. Because, I mean, that quote you read about, you know, keeping people from getting into families and encouraging them to exit them. <laughs> this, you know, the, Burke had a phrase for this, metaphysical madness. Let me suggest that your, your view just now of the, of the reality of the patriarchal family, particularly in Anglo-Saxon societies, is well captured in two late 1940s movies, Meet Me in St. Louis, and I think his father knows best, in which the father makes a decision which causes unhappiness and tears in the rest of the family. The mother rallies them to support the father, who is, yeah, after yeah. all, doing the best for them all, and then he subsequently relents <laughs> and, and agrees he won't do what he was proposing and every and harmony is completely restored. Think Possibly. of Mrs. Miniver, <laughs> you know, yeah. who's running that family? <laughs> to Tocqueville says that he's very sensitive to this transition from the older patriarchal family to this more egalitarian democratic family, but he said there was a moment that he really applauded. And he said he saw in America real affection before fa between fathers and sons. Yeah. And he said he didn't see that. He, he I, I think, was rather close to his father, Hervé, but it was his father was his father in a, in a, in a, in a you know, there was an element of command yeah. of more traditional authority. And Tocqueville was very impressed to see families that loved each other, you know, that, you know, somehow united, yeah. con consent with a deep bond of affection. And maybe that was the Anglo-American way for a long time. It uh, Some elements of the old, but with a greater place for freedom. And certainly in principle, the recognition that women are equal. Even if, to use Aristotle's phrase, women were mainly, their special task was in the oikos, you know, raising the kids. Tocqueville and Rousseau say women are the secret rulers of the human race because they control the education of the children and therefore shape human character in a much more fundamental way than fathers do. Now, the feminists would not agree with that, but um, um, there's something to that. Well, we certainly see, I mean, the, the, I think, I'm now going to open, open it to you all, but I remember the marvelous line uh, of Senator Phil Graham, who was, um, um, questioning uh, a, a panel of social workers and um, and bureaucrats from the HHS in uh, in America, and the uh, one of the bureaucrats said, "Senator, I love your children as much as you do." And he replied, "Oh, really? What are their names?" <laughs> <laughs> um, good. Oh, uh, let me open this to the floor now. Uh, yes, uh, Eric. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your contributions. I was delighted that at the end you, you made some civilizational comparative remarks about, about China and filial piety, because I think that sheds a different light on, on matters. So this whole discussion, most of it, of uh, the family in Western political thought and the importance of the family for conservative tradition is really, um, it really proceeds uh, from a, political, a contemporary political context. Uh, we, are, we are faced politically with a challenge to the family coming from certain branches of progressivism and, and liberalism. So even though that is, uh, that, that is an urgent, uh, that, that is an urgent political challenge that we need to face up to, it does skew or limit our perspective on the, the role of the family in the Western political tradition, and even the role of the family for conservatism, because it, it narrows our it narrows us. As soon as we zoom out and we look at something like China, we suddenly find out that actually the Western political tradition is not really pro that pro family, and that actually the conservatives uh, are not so pro family. So, in the a key a key text in the in the Chinese uh, Confucian canon is the classical filial piety, which was especially important in Neo-Confucianism, so that of the last, uh, of the Ming Dynasty and the Qing Dynasty. 
And it holds that um, the whole state and in fact the cosmos is held together by the filial piety of uh, children for their parents. And uh, by honoring their parents, they also honor the, the ruler of the country. And by the ruler is honoring his ancestors. And by and the ruler honoring his ancestors, everyone is everyone is inspired to love their to love their own uh, parents. And in this sense, the love of the love of parents is made the cornerstone of whole of politics. And then you look at so those are key political texts in the, in the Chinese uh, Confucian canon. And then you compare this with the Politica of Aristotle. On the very first page, he says the state is not a family. It's crucial. The state consists of different parts with different qualities. Right, so we are like the, the Western thinking has always been very pluralistic and driving a very strong wedge between family and state. If you if you compare it to the to the East Asian tradition, now they did recently a research among Asian Americans and and asked them about cultural differences that they perceived in general between America and China, and this is a very pro-Western audience, right? Asian Americans really feel to see themselves as Western. They are Western. They're embedded in Western culture. They love America. They live in America. They see the future in America. So. The, the, the questions showed a very positive impression of, of America and a much less positive impression of China. However, on the, on, when it came to family values, it was very clear. The family values in China, they were perceived as much stronger than in America. But so this is, so Western civilization is not actually uh, the pro-West, uh, the, pro, uh, the pro-family civilization. And actually conservatives are not really that pro-family. We're only pro-family compared to crazy anti-family progressives. <laughs> But but we really there's really very strong limits to the way we're to our willingness to push family metaphors in political thinking. As soon as somebody would say, you know, the the leader is like a father to me, we we're all we're all weirded out. Um, so there's an, in in China, if an official is good, so if someone is considered a good public official, they call him a fumu guan, which is a father mother official, because he's like a father and a mother to the people. And the people honor that official by saying, this person is like a, a, a parent to me. That, that's uh, a brilliant contribution, which has delighted me, because partly because someone had mentioned to me this, uh, this structural connection in the uh, constitutional document that you quoted between the family or the Deep. filial piety and state piety or gov- piety towards civil government. So to hear it put in such... Um, coherent and learned way i really appreciate that and i'm very i'm excited to pursue that further i don't know what happened to my microphone uh it's been stolen but i'll give you mine in a second um uh but i've got the power now so i'm just going to speak for a minute (laughs) um uh what was i going to say i I think we could possibly say similar things perhaps with maybe with less charity about some islamic kind of aspects of islamic civilization They're, they're probably strongly uh, but strongly, there are strongly patriarchal elements in Islamic civilization that might be helpful for political life. But I don't know whether there's a theoretical connection in, in the way that you've outlined it. I'd have to I'd have to research that more. Uh, brilliant insight. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I am not. I'm, I'm sure it's rolling around beneath me. But yeah. uh, in any case, yeah, uh, Eric, I think those are very fine remarks. I would just say, I would say the West had a balanced a much more balanced understanding of the relationship between the individual, the family, and the political community. But you're right. I, that was really what I was trying to get out, that there was uh, never patriarchalism in the strictest sense of the term. It would be interesting, I think, to compare the Roman case, old Rome, the Roman Republic, with China. Because if you read, let's say, Fusto uh, de Colange, the great... Um, uh, French proto-sociologist, Durkheim's cousin, I think, he, uh, um, in the ancient city, he emphasizes just how strange Rome was, the ancestor worship, the centrality of the family gods. Um, and uh, what Christianity does, what bib- bib- biblical religion relativizes all of that. We don't worship our ancestors. We have a piety toward them, as Burke and Scruton says, but that's very, very different than ancestor worship and I would say, you know, Asiatic civilizations are rather a- atheistic, you know. They're very, I, I know there's theistic dimensions of Buddhism and all that, but in a way all they have is this world and the family. Yeah. And so the idea of 
um, the kind of the, the two cities that um, Augustine doesn't introduce so much as to theorize in a very complete and comprehensive way that, you know, the, the idea that the, the goods of this world, even the goods of family, look at, look at scripture. I mean, Mary is at the cross when Jesus is dying. At the same time, uh, Jesus rebukes his family in Nazareth. You know, there's a relativization of the importance of family vis-a-vis -vis higher transcendent concerns. And sometimes it's quite jarring to hear yeah. Christ say that kind of thing. So, um, but the Roman Chinese example seems very interesting because it seems to me those are two great civilizations where family piety and ancestor worship were at the core of civic and religious yeah. piety. And I think it would be very interesting to explore that. Yeah. Not, not today, of course. Um, I, I should just a codicil on Todd. Um, we had a we had a talk here by James C. Bennett, better known for his work on the idea of the Anglosphere, um, um, and, and a debate between him and the late um, um, Hungarian European uh, uh, MEP. Um, uh, gosh, I've now forgotten his name. Uh, um, um, got. Yes, uh, George, George, George Shofflin. Yes, George Shofflin. Who, and that, that's available on the internet somewhere. You know, we, we put it out. Uh, and in fact, I think Bennett will be coming here sometime later this year as a fellow. And, and I think that although we've really invited him to talk about other things, I think we may get him to try to reprise some, some of that, actually. Um, well, good. Um, David, do you want to do, ask a question? Yeah, well, a lot of the uh, a lot of the points I wanted to to bring forward have been brought forward in the last couple of minutes. One I think is really fascinating: this peculiarity of consent in entering into the sacrament or the contract of marriage, which I think, incidentally, is crucial to Kant's discussion. Um, but this leads me back by way of Eric's comment to a thematic which was entirely lacking, which I think illuminates both the, the Roman-Chinese connection and, and the disruption between Greco-Roman morals and Christian European morals, and that is the cult of virginity in early Christianity, which incidentally, Michel Foucault is extremely good on this in the, the last three volumes. The first is abominable, but the last three volumes of his history of sexuality is, are actually very good. And he points out that Christian Europe inherits mon monogamy not from Israel, but from the Greeks and the Romans. But what stands between Greco-Roman monogamy, which was held in extremely high regard, and Christian European sacramental marriage, which can only be entered into freely by both parties who both bear the image of God, is the capacity for both men and women to step outside the family and say, I'm living a life of perpetual celibacy, which does not exist in any other civilization. Perpetual celibacy is an extremely bizarre sort of possibility for the individual, which can only be entered into volitionally as well. And it all relates back to these sayings, these troublesome, these kind of abrasive sayings in the gospels, which Professor Mahoney just raised. So I'm curious how, and I, I even listening to you, I, I begin to wonder whether what might have occurred, I'm a Protestant myself, uh, mea culpa, but what might have occurred is that basically uh, R Roman Christianity created a sort of freedom for the individual yeah. to step outside the family, which then with the abolition of the monasteries, yeah. left this kind of freedom without a, a, a predetermined horizon within the church, which is a family. What is, the, what is the head of the Roman Catholic Church called? Papa, right? Okay, so there, there was an alternate family. Augustine stands so prominently in this history. And I'm just curious if, if we need to think more about virginity well, it seems to be that, uh, I don't know whether it's perpetual, but celibacy seems to be something that is spreading among the laptop classes who spend all their time working and have less and less time, according to the statistics, for sex. Whether it's They're also waiting for the singularity for when they merge with their computers in the year 2039. <laughs> I'm not making that up. Uh, uh, no, those are wonderful remarks, David, and I'd say... Um, 
Yeah, I do think, um, to go back to that relativization of the family, Pope Benedict actually wrote about this in his book, Jesus of Nazareth. He says, there's no spiritual corporate institution in the history of the world that has been more insistent on the rights of the family, the dignity of the family, than the Catholic Church. But he says, at the same time, uh, uh, it also relativizes the family in light of higher claims. And I would say that the convents, the monasteries, uh, the idea of both celibate, celibacy and perpetual virginhood and all of these, these from a, from a sort of comparative sociological view, I think you're right, these are very unique innovations, but they also allow for recognition that the family is not a total institution the way it, it might. I don't mean totalitarian institution in the Chinese case, but a total way of life. You know, no one opts out of that unless you're a, a deviant or uh, somehow, uh, um, you know, naturally challenged. Yeah. You know, so I think uh, I think, uh, and you, I think you're right too with the Reformation, the assault on the monasteries, the secularization of society. That, that option outside of the family t began, it took many centuries, but it began to take a more transgressive and radically in individualistic form and finding a way of articulating that option that doesn't demand, you know, sort of the demoralization or desacralization of the social order is, uh, is really important. I just think this came to mind as I was listening to David's remarks. Uh, it seems to me the way St. Augustine and the Romans treat the rape of Lucretia is so revealing here. You know, Lucretia gets re raped, and it wasn't her fault, but the only honorable thing to do is commit suicide. Well, what does St. Augustine say? St. Augustine says he relativizes that shame, honor, ethos, and he says, well, God knows you had no ill intent, no lust in your heart, but you're innocent. So don't kill yourself. You know, you're, you're a, not a sinner in, in, in that case in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. And an example that for all the continuity, and I think David's right about monogamy being a point of continuity, but Christianity added something. And I think if you think about Augustine's rewriting of the rape of Lucretia, it, um, I think in a way that we would applaud, that we, we judge her by her, her character and intentions and not by an act that was forcibly imposed on her. Well, also, I mean, and you both might want to look at this. Um, what you've just said about the rape of Lucretia has some relevance to the Muslim family. Uh, and and the, and of course the Muslim family in Western society in particular, uh, because honor killings are not unknown in Britain or Australia. I think. No, no. Just a quick response to a really interesting point uh, about vocational virginity. In the Christian tradition is that, I mean, it's probably, I'm just reflecting on what you said, and it seems to me ambiguous as to what, whether the role that that plays in the narrative of the family in the West is, it seems ambiguous as to whether it's positive or negative. It could have, like you said, it could have led to a sort of, you know, unhinging of singleness after the destruction of the monasteries. It could, have, it could also be constructive and positive in that it's such a distinct institution from the natural family, that it could actually perform a, a constructive, almost bolstering, have, it could have a bolstering effect, I guess, uh, an undergirding effect on the family and society. So I would want to think about that more. And it's, it just makes me realise how different the Christian approach to that particular question is in relation, in if you compare it to the Jewish tradition, which has such a strong household-centred view of the, the human person. Uh, you're always the son of someone and you're part of a tribe. A single person is probably still viewed like that, but maybe not in the same way. I, I want to think about this more. Thank you for a good question. If you read Plutarch's Life of Lycurgus, the Spartans made the, uh, the men who didn't get married run around the public square naked in a display of public shame, you know, because they were clearly uh, not the kind of zoon politicon they were supposed to be. So 
The Christian West always had room for people on the edge, you know. Um, I, I, yeah, look, and I, I would say that the church always saved itself from fanaticism but by realizing that the call to holiness was, in the fullest sense, maybe for the few. Jesus does say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, but, you know, the life without, you know, they tried, uh, you know, communal property at the beginning of Acts, and it lasted a few years and ended in calamity as it usually does, so that's a monastic option. Uh, and um, I'd say the same thing with those who opt out of uh, of, of con family life, conjugal relations. It's not seen. Now, I think there's some debates in the Christian tradition. Is the is the one higher? And there are sort of Jansenist elements in Catholicism and Reformed Christianity that you know diminish you know the mm -hmm. the goodness of uh, the natural family and conjugation compared to the perfection of this higher life, but. I don't think that's ever been the dominant note. I don't quite see how evolutionary psychology describes perpetual virginity, but there, there we are. Um, any other questions? In that case, oh, yes, the gentleman here. Well, I'm not trying to be funny, but uh, I would like to ask you when you said the rule of a man over women, um, is that your observation or a quote. Oh, I was just um, I was just introducing the th fact that um, look in the oikos in the in the Greek household, uh, men had a, a, a pride of place. But Aristotle, uh, no, I'm not rec recommending the restoration of the Greek oikos, but I am saying that Aristotle emphatically denies that it can and should be a despotic relationship. He says it's a royal and political. The king exercises authority justly for the common good, but a political relationship ruling and being ruled in turn is reciprocal. In other words, uh, the woman is a full citizen in the family. So my point was quite the opposite, I think probably what you're trying to suggest. It's not that the men rule arbitrarily. Aristotle is saying it is unjust and false to see the man, to encourage the man to be a, a despot. But that's why I didn't ask whether you are married. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, but that's, that's what I meant. But rule, I don't think the word rule, when, when Aristotle speaks about political rule, it's not forcible command. It's reciprocity. It's the back and forth of free. There's freedom in the family, and that's a really revolutionary idea. That yeah. begins with Aristotle. Dr. Kennedy, um, yes. your statement, which is um, very interesting, why people identify with their nationality uh, based on their parentage. So then, what nationality are those who quite openly go against their nations at international forums. Yeah, I, and I, I would, I, it's a very good question. I was speaking generally, uh, that generally people identify with their nation based on their family. Uh, not everyone does. People move around, people defy their nationhood. Of course, there are lots of exceptions. Yeah, absolutely. But, 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 but hang on a second. Yes, sorry. Uh, I think we could add that, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion around Brexit. Uh, you know, the people from somewhere and the people from nowhere. That, that really is a meaningful distinction. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. are a lot of intellectuals. Well, we can call them for point of convenience, the sort of Davos crowd, you know, who, who identify as people from nowhere. They're, they're self-conscious cosmopolitans, and they often... They, they want a post-sovereign, post-national, post-political form of democracy. And then I think most ordinary blokes, as the British say, are people from somewhere. And their attachments are not all that different than those attachments described by Burke in 1791. But, but this is, I think, a very topical question, isn't it? Not simply because of Brexit, but because there have always been, of course, intellectuals who were felt alienated from their own country. And Burke's 
reflection of the French Revolution is, is essentially a response to one of them, Dr. Price, but um, it was never until recently a mass phenomenon. And now, alienation, cultural self-hatred, these are things which um, in Western societies at least, I don't know about a Asia, uh, Eric, um, are nonetheless mass phenomena and may decide elections. I mean, I think this is the point at which we have to end. So I'm going to ask you so both. Burke, Burke has a very uh, pertinent comment in the reflections. He's commenting on the atheism that sort of hung around the French Revolution. And he says the atheists of old, like the Epicureans, were a very timid lot. They weren't interested in turning, creating atheist societies and turning the hoi polloi into atheists. They had a rather realistic view of human nature. But um, um, Burke says, our atheists, these politicized intellectuals, they're an enterprising lot. They're, they're connecting atheism to modern revolution. And that means an active effort to transform society. And that's something new. Not atheism, but the enterprising activist revolutionary atheist. And this has to be the last point, Simon. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you. Oh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I, and I think, I think, yeah, in, again, in response to your question, I think that that cosmopolitan internationalist, the person who doesn't identify with a particular place at heart is historically unusual for a reason, and that's because typically, and I think rightly, people identify themselves with, first of all, with their families. And they if they, if they don't have a family, like John, you pointed out, some people don't, know who their family is or they might have acquired a family legally uh, through um, being adopted, they, re they know the, uh, that they, they, they know how tangible that lack is. They know what that feels like. Yeah. Um, and I think that the current trend toward being uh, unattached to your nation is unusual and won't persist for that long, to be quite honest. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, both our speakers uh, have given us uh, a tremendous um, feast here. Um, Simon, thank you for those opening remarks, which opened up a whole series of vistas. Daniel, thank you for coming in and, and I got uh, adding. I through to the 10:30 last night. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad I was. <laughs> and, <laughs> yes, and, and so are we all. Uh, so I want to thank you. I'll end with one quote. Um, it's from G.K. Chesterton. Uh, Marriage is a duel to the, to the death, which no man of honor should refuse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, gentlemen, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.